Before we talk about the content of Grossman's on, on Killing, I have to do something that I don't normally do. In general, it's my view that even if I find a, a really great thinker who I disagree with and I think says or argues for ridiculous things, I still know that they are brilliant, and so I still know if I really figure out their assumptions and the questions they're asking, I can see why their answers are brilliant, I just disagree with their assumptions or I'm asking different questions. Grossman's a little different though, right, because, sorry, let me say the bad news first, he is not a very careful thinker or scholar. I don't make it, I don't want you to think that there's this ivory tower and only scholars belong there. No, ordinary people can be very careful scholars and thinkers. I just don't think Grossman is. Now, focus on the positive for a second. The positive is that this book by Grossman gathered a lot of attention and most of it was great because it brought to light, right, it brought to the public this data about firing rates and about PTSD. This really floored people when it came out, and so that was brilliant. This data was out there, but very few people in the public were noticing about it. And of course, it started a nice little controversy about how could you possibly say that my veteran grandpa didn't shoot his weapon when he was in the war? Well, that's fascinating because when this comes out, right, it's starting to get all this backlash. And what happens? Grossman talks to officers and they say, no, the book's exactly right. My job as an officer was just try to get these people to shoot because they wouldn't unless I was around. But ordinary civilians found it pretty offensive. So that kind of controversy and debate, really important, and I'm grateful that he put out this book. But at the same time, he is not very careful. He does tend to overstate his conclusions. He also, in the rest of his work, did some things that I found pretty offensive and not very careful. He used some of his research and some of his other works to use this psychological data to find ways to get soldiers back into battle quicker. He would find little stop gaps or short-term treatments for PTSD that would help them overcome some of the worst of the symptoms so they could get back into battle quicker, thus making their long-term symptoms and making their further treatment even harder to deal with. So that just deplores me. So first, the big issue. What were the firing rates in the Civil War and in the World Wars, right? So let's talk about the research he's done. I am reading the first real paragraph on page one of Grossman's On Killing. Author of the Civil War Collector's Encyclopedia, F.A. Lord, tells us that after the Battle of Gettysburg, 27,574 muskets were recovered from the battlefield. Of these, nearly 90%, 24,000 were loaded. 12,000 of these loaded muskets were found to be loaded more than once, and 6,000 of the multiply loaded weapons had from 3 to 10 rounds loaded in the barrel. Skip one full paragraph. The obvious conclusion is that most soldiers were not trying to kill the enemy. Most of them appear to have not even wanted to fire in the enemy's general direction. As Marshall observed, most soldiers seem to have an inner resistance to firing their weapon in combat. Now let's pause and give a little bit of the data, and let me give you some background that you'll find in the, in the longer book. First, so what do we have? Firing rates. In the Civil War and the World Wars, Grossman asserts 15 to 20 percent at most are firing their weapons. Now a little background data. When they did uh, research on these ancient battlefields and they would find these loaded weapons, well, what does this mean? I mean, this is almost comical. According to Grossman, this means they're faking it. They're loading their weapons and reloading it, and then they get up front, and I'm hoping, I mean, just for comic effect, they make firing noises with their mouth or uh, imitate the retraction of the gun, like, oh, right, boom, and then pretend, and then load it again. The other interesting tidbit is in, when they checked the battlefield, they would find bullets in, that had gone into the ground, and they're entering the ground at angles like this or like this or something. So these aren't the normal kind of parabola of a bullet entering the ground at this kind of short distance. What does this mean? When people are firing, they're either firing over the heads of the enemy or firing at the ground and the bullets are going straight in. So in the Civil War, at least, 
the data might suggest that the firing rates are even lower. Sorry, what I should say is the firing rates are low, but people aiming at the enemy actually make this number even lower in terms of trying to kill the enemy. Fortunately for us, our course is so well planned out that we've already seen the psychological experiments of Milgram. So let's pause here and talk about what causes people to fire in these situations. So let me read. Let me start at the bottom of page one and then skip around a little bit on page two. I'll tell you where I am. Very bottom of page one, Milgram. I observed a mature and initially poised businessman enter the laboratory smiling and confident. Within 20 minutes, he was reduced to a twitching, stuttering wreck who was rapidly approaching a point of nervous collapse. At one point, he pushed his fist into his forehead and muttered, Oh God, let's stop it. And yet he continued to respond to every word of the experimenter and obeyed to the end. Skip two paragraphs. Leaders with legitimate, societally sanctioned authority have greater influence on their soldiers and legitimate lawful demands are more likely to be obeyed than illegal or unanticipated demands. Now notice, did we see these effects in the Milgram experiment when the authority left the room or when they moved the experiment from Yale? We saw exactly this. Next paragraph. If your propaganda machine can convince your soldiers that their opponents are not really human but are inferior forms of life, then their natural resistance to killing their own species will be reduced. Skip two indents, because I think this is an important clarification. The adolescent soldier against whom such propaganda is directed is desperately trying to rationalize what he is being forced to do, and he is therefore predisposed to believe this nonsense. Right there is Grossman at his best. That is such a carefully written line. I am incredibly happy with this. Notice what it's saying. In these conditions of authority, like we saw in Milgram, you find yourself forced to do what the authority figure wants. But what happens? Your mind can't handle what it's dealing with, so it has to rationalize some reason after the fact for what you've just done and what usually helps you deal with your guilt. Oh, that wasn't a human being. That was a rodent, uh, World War II. That was a cockroach, if we're talking Rwanda. And that somehow, even though it's stupid and you don't really believe it, you're trying to believe it so you can cope with what you've done. So now let's jump ahead historically. What do you find when you get to Vietnam? Firing rates increase to 95%. But I think we should consider some other factors that, mil that sorry, I think we should consider some other factors that Grossman doesn't really mention. And these are quite obvious to those of you who study this history, but his point is still valid. It just might not explain everything fully. So let's consider a couple other things that are at play during Vietnam. First, weapons are very different. Second, warfare is very different. Weapons, semi-automatic and automatic weapons make firing a lot easier. You are not firing at one target at a time. You have resources of several bullets, so you can shoot kind of haphazardly and still fire a weapon. It's not aim fire as a command. You are kind of on your own. Second, warfare. This is guerrilla warfare. You are not lined up in rows shooting at a target, right? The, the uh, enemy is hiding. The enemy could come at you from any direction. And oftentimes you're using your weapon just to suppress a region, right? Your officer could say, okay, I need suppressing fire on that bank while all of us walk over here. And so you could be firing, not even thinking you're actually firing at a human target. You're just firing whenever you see movement. And so it's not directly clear whether you're firing at a human being. And so the natural resistance might not be triggered so obviously in Vietnam. So let's read. Very top of page three. World War II era training was conducted on a grassy, a grassy firing range, a known distance or RD range, on which the soldier shot at bullseye targets. After he fired a series of shots, the target was checked, and he was then given feedback and told, told him where he hit. Modern training uses what are essentially B.F. Skinner's operant conditioning techniques to develop a firing behavior in the soldier. This training comes as close to simulating actual combat conditions as possible. The soldier stands in a foxhole with full combat equipment, and man-shaped targets pop up briefly in front of him. These are the eliciting stimuli that prompt the target behavior of shooting. If the target is hit, it immediately drops, thus providing immediate feedback. 
Positive reinforcement is given when these hits are exchanged for marksmanship badges, which usually have some form of privilege, privilege or reward, praise, recognition, three-day passes, and so on, associated with them. So notice what Grossman is saying here. The key difference in Vietnam, besides the things we just mentioned, is the way that the training worked. Before you were training in, you were trained in how to shoot, now you're trained in the full gamut of behavior because we're trying to get you to, we'll get into the psychology in a second, fire without thinking too much about it. Yes, we teach mark, marksmanship and so forth, but we're trying to stimulate the whole series of actions you will go through when you're in actual combat. And so we want to mimic combat as much as possible. Quick tangent. I have a buddy that used to do this sort of training, and he showed me pictures. He showed me pictures of, of actual battlefield situations in neighborhoods in Iraq, and then he showed me pictures of his training facilities up near Santa Fe. And then he shuffled the pictures together and asked me, okay, Jeff, which one of these do you think is Iraq, and which ones are my training facilities? And I couldn't tell. He said, we have all the signage the same, we make the neighborhoods look identical, we have people walking by in civilian garb, and they really do when they are in Iraq. I can imagine that their brains really don't realize they're not in a simulator in my training program in Santa Fe until, my buddy would say, until they actually kill someone and then their brain freaks out. So what is the key? The key is conditioning firing behavior so that the brain can overcome its natural resistance to killing its own species. So then, according to Grossman, and this is a little oversimplified, right? what are the key causes for PTSD? Uh, let me read the third paragraph on page three. The killing enabling factors provide a powerful set of tools to bypass or overcome the soldier's resistance to killing. But as we will see in the section Killing in Vietnam, the, highest, sorry, the higher the resistance bypassed, the higher the trauma that must be overcome in the subsequent rationalization process. Killing comes with a price, and all societies must learn that their soldiers will have to spend the rest of their lives living with what they have done. So pause there. For Grossman, and this is a nice, tidy explanation, and it does go quite a ways, although we'll bring in more of the serious data in a, in a little bit. But, so notice, for Grossman, there's a direct relationship between how much of your natural resistance you overcome and what your symptoms of PTSD and, the key here, moral guilt will be. Some people have the idea that it is fear that causes PTSD. And so when you look at the word PTSD, trauma is the key word, and so they think that any sort of trauma will produce PTSD. Well, any sort of trauma will produce some sort of symptoms, but not the kind that combat soldiers have with PTSD. Again, we'll get into the details more. So, let's read further. Let's hear how terrible this situation was in Vietnam when we really realized what we were doing to our soldiers. So, third to last paragraph of the whole Grossman article. Estimates of the number of Vietnam veterans suffering from PTSD range from the disabled American veterans figure of 500,000 to Harrison Associates' 1980 estimates of 1.5 million or, in other words, somewhere between 18 and 54 percent of the 2.8 million military personnel who served in Vietnam. To make those numbers even more harrowing, in that total number of people who have served in Vietnam and went in country, think of how many of them did not face direct combat situations. Not only are there support personnel, but there are some people who, and I would say fortunately, don't face an actual combat situation. So we've got a percentage that has to be skewed based on those numbers to say, lowest estimate is, what, 40, 50 percent if we think of people actually facing direct combat. So what can we say so far about human nature? If we're only looking at Grossman, and we shouldn't try to overstate what we have here, but at the very least we can say that killing is something humans are not designed to do. They cannot cope with it when they do it. And so at the very least you could say possibly that our social self is not sadistic, that's obvious, not selfish when it comes to the most severe sorts of harms to people of their own species, 
And what I like to do is move to the innate self and say, well, the innate self is at least sympathetic when it comes to situations like this. We feel what the other person is feeling in some drastic sense. Let's bring in a really important scholar when it comes to PTSD. Let's talk about the work of Jonathan Shea. He has two brilliant books. If you have relatives dealing with PTSD and you, or you yourself are suffering from, these are two absolutely brilliant books that are both readable and very carefully thought out. Uh, his two most famous books are Achilles in Vietnam and Odysseus in America. What I will be talking about primarily here is Achilles in Vietnam. Now, before we get into this, let's have a little brief aside. This would be funny if it wasn't so tragic, but let's listen to, first, the history of the concept of PTSD in our society. So, let's trace it, let's go back through the history, and notice what's happening here. We are dealing with more what are called euphemisms. Words chosen to mislead an audience to make something bad sounds like it's not so bad. We all know that euphemisms are an almost necessary part of war. You don't talk about war directly. You use different language that hides what's actually happening. You killed your buddy? Oh, that's friendly fire. You killed a bunch of children? Oh, collateral damage. We're used to this language. But let's talk about what's happened in our society when it comes to the misleading euphemisms for PTSD. So today, of course, we call it PTSD. I think it's a terrible word for it, right? We should understand what it means, even though that acronym doesn't get at it. So let's go back. Uh, 15 years ago, what did they call this? So think of Iraq War, technically Iraq War number two and three. We're now in Iraq War four, maybe five pretty soon. What did we call it in the desert storm days? If you can remember, combat fatigue syndrome. So now, why is this so misleading? Well, the misleading ideas about every euphemism is it tells you a very different story about what causes the symptoms and what sort of things we should do to treat it. If you have combat fatigue syndrome, what caused it? Uh, you're overworked. You're tired. And so obviously, what's the treatment? A nap. You need a break. Now, of course, you could use a break, but it's not just tiredness or exhaustion. That's incredibly misleading, so the military doesn't have to take it as seriously. World Wars. Some of you know this one, too. What did we call PTSD in the World Wars? Shell shock. Well, now clearly. So what's the cause of shell shock? Um, loud noises and concussive forces. So what's the treatment? You need rest, right? You need some peace and quiet. Now, here's the one that very few people would know. If you know this, you should absolutely applaud yourself. What did we call PTSD during the Civil War? Wait for it. Nostalgia. Now, you English majors know what nostalgia means. These are fond memories of the past. You were thinking back to your elementary school days or something like this. So what is this? You're having nightmares and you're freaking out at night because of your memories of battle. But what is it really? Oh, it's just nostalgia. You're remembering those good old days when you were dying alongside your buddies, right? And dying of infections and trying to shoot at one another. Oh, that's just nostalgia. All right. So let's let us be some of the few people in our society that truly understands PTSD. First thing that I'm always asked is, but Jeff, that's really rude of you to say that only soldiers have PTSD because I've been diagnosed with PTSD, right? All sorts of people have PTSD. Now, please don't get mad at me because I think you'll agree with me when you hear me out. That PTSD, like many, many things, is a spectrum disorder. But we need to start talking that way more carefully. Now, what I mean by a spectrum disorder is that there are varying levels of severity. You could be PTSD level 1, or you could be extreme combat PTSD level 10. So let's talk about it using those numbers. And what I would say is we should reserve a word like combat PTSD for the PTSD that's up there in ranges 8, 9, and 10. So yes, you could say someone who is in a car accident has PTSD, but we should say that the severity of the symptoms could be at a fairly low level. 
you have PTSD level two or three, and notice one of the key issues here is how long will it last? Well, most uh, trauma of a car accident will fade over time. That's a key thing about PTSD at the, at the lower levels. Given time, it will fade. Okay. So let's talk about putting all of the work together, the main causes of PTSD. And here is the key lesson. The amount of these causes you experience and their intensity results directly in how long and how intense your symptoms will be. So when we're up at the full range of causes, combat PTSD range is 8, 9, and 10, these symptoms are incredibly intense and will last a long time. I'm so sorry. So, three technically four causes. The, the first or primary cause is moral guilt. And this moral guilt that is at, at its most intense when you feel that you have done something that failed humanity. The obvious case, Phil and Grossman, killing a human being. But this can also relate to other triggers of moral guilt, such as letting people down. And in a combat situation, this means I feel responsible for my buddy dying. Right? I failed to protect a human being there, and that moral guilt can be just as intense as killing. Second major cause. This is really fascinating when you think of what we've been doing so far, and, and especially bringing in Milgram. Shea focuses on the cause of betrayal by authority. When you feel that you are given orders that led to you killing someone who shouldn't have been killed, or your buddy dying who you feel that you should have protected, and this is the terrible orders of one of your officers, you feel betrayed by authority. Psychologically, this gets you to distrust authority, but you don't know how to deal with this because you are in an obedient situation. In Vietnam, some soldiers would even say just the terrible equipment they were giving they were given was a betrayal by authority. Uh, let's see, well, let me try to remember. What was it in Vietnam? I think it was an M16. Well, these were known to jam when they got wet. Well, what is Vietnam? Rain almost 24-7 is the norm in Vietnam. So guns would jam. So the enemy jumps out of a bush, kills, is shooting at your buddy, and your gun jams and you can't protect him. Well, who's to blame? You're going to blame yourself, but partly it's betrayal by authority. I could have protected my buddy if this gun actually worked. The third major cause of PTSD, and this one will make a lot of sense if we're thinking about this, is what we could call prolonged vigilance. This is the idea that you are spending long periods of time in what we'll talk about later as in the fight or flight sort of syndrome. You are in a rush of adrenaline as you are worried about your own survival and what is happening around you. Here, let me, let me give a goofy example. I often get up real early in the morning and get my work done while everyone else is asleep. So I will be walking downstairs and I don't turn lights on because that'll wake someone up. And what often happens is I will lose count of the steps on my way downstairs. And so I will, I'm on the last step, but I think I'm on the kitchen floor. And so what happens, I free fall for what, like six inches in the dark. And so in that free fall, notice what happens. I'm in fight or flight. And so time slows down. I'm paying attention to everything. I land after falling for six full inches and I am in my ninja mode, right? Ready to see how am I going to live through this? What's going to happen? And so my heart starts racing because what's happening, my, sorry, amygdala in my midbrain is saying, get ready for trouble, right? And then you're just focused on survival. Well, so if you have these sorts of adrenaline, just rushes of experience for long periods of time, your brain is getting acclimated to that as a normal frame of reference. And so think of being in guerrilla warfare like Vietnam, like Iraq, Afghanistan, for long periods, your brain is starting to get used to that sort of experience. And so that involves a whole different set of traumas. We should also talk about, and this is kind of a parenthetical point, right? 
but there is a fourth trigger of PTSD, but this really comes into play when we're kind of beyond the spectrum of PTSD. And so I would call this PTSD level 11. It's what is known as the ber berserker state. And many theorists would say that the berserker state is at least somewhat permanent. This is a complete chemical change of the brain and you will just have to deal with these symptoms. They won't fade away. What is the key four symptom for the berserker? Put the other three symptoms together with surviving certain death. This somehow just changes something in the brain and the person just snaps. Let's talk a little bit about this because it's so fascinating, even though it's so awful. The worst aspects are, about it are, we used to think it was a good thing. There are some ancient cultures that used to encourage their soldiers to go berserk because what happens, you're fearless. What's actually happening is not fearlessness, it's more like a death wish. Here is where we can make sense of a weird little piece of trivia that some of you have heard of. Do you know that a lot of soldiers that have some of the most amazing medals of valor don't keep their medals or don't keep them out. They put them away, sell them, or lose them. Why? Here's what's fascinating. Because many of these battles are won during berserker moments. And what happens in berserker moments, you are out of your mind. You are trying to kill everyone, and most people would think that you have a death wish. You are trying to kill as many people as possible, and you think that you cannot die. What are some of the narratives we hear about these cases? The people take off their armor, throw off their helmet because I can't be killed. And so it looks like they have a death wish. They run straight into the enemy bunkers and just start shooting everyone single-handedly, killing tons of people. Now, the problem is you are so out of your mind that you will kill your buddies as well. So most of the time the berserk state is stopped because you are grabbed by your own soldiers and they take you away. So what happens? You are given some medal for single-handedly defeating a whole bunker full of enemy and you don't remember a thing you've done. In your experience you are blacked out and they have to tell you what you have done because your mind was pretty much shut off at that point. And again, the long-term symptoms are awful. You will need adrenaline inhibitors just to be able to get through your day. So notice, if we use this analysis and talk about our spectrum, we would find, so let's see, if you listen to the, uh, the other video, you will hear that I had this pretty terrible assault story where I was nearly killed. I was dealt with brain damage and so forth. So my assault story, think of the triggers. I didn't have moral guilt. I didn't feel it was my fault. I was nearly beaten to death, right? Um, was there betrayal by authority? No. Was there vigilance? Yes, there was, you know, a handful of moments of vigilance, and then in recovery I was still pretty traumatized by things, but this isn't long-term like guerrilla warfare. I didn't survive certain death or something like this, right? It wasn't that kind of a combat situation. So, for me, we would say when it first happened I probably had PTSD level, say, two or three, what were my experiences? Well, when I was able to regain speech and, and go back to a normal life, I did find myself pretty afraid when I was in the streets of Chicago, for example. I remember one night we were at some music event, right, downtown, and we were hanging out outside, and I had to tell my buddies, okay guys, I am so sorry, but I'm a little bit freaked out by this many people around. It's, it's scaring me because of what happened with my assault. But what happened? Over time, within a couple months, I was down to PTSD level one, and then after six months, all the symptoms were gone. That's what light level PTSD is like. But, key question, can you get PTSD levels eight, nine, or ten without being a soldier in combat? Yes, it's possible, but it is going to be thankfully fairly rare. But let me tell you the story of a student I had that did have these levels of PTSD, but notice how well her story correlates with the way we are handling our key symptoms. Okay, so here was her story. This is terrible. Her life is so hard these days. 
Uh, for instance, she has constant seizures and flashbacks. It's very hard for her to get through a, a one hour and 15 minute class. She has to take breaks. She has to have someone there to watch her in case she really starts to have you know, a traumatic recollection. But anyway, here is her terrible story. When she was a kid, her neighbor was abusing the local children in the neighborhood. And, right, so let's go through the list. Moral guilt. Part of her abuse was that this neighbor would force her to abuse and mistreat the other kids in the neighborhood. He was forcing her to do terrible things to the other children. Betrayal by authority. This was a beloved member of the community. And so other people like this guy, and here's what he would tell the kids. If you tell your parents what we are doing here, I will kill your parents. Betrayal by authority. Prolonged vigilance. Yes, this went on for days and days, and this was, became just a normal aspect of her childhood over years. Anyway, so what happens with her? Very high level PTSD, even though she technically wasn't in combat, but the triggers explain her case really well. So pause here. So again, now that we've seen this, what are the obvious implications for human nature? Again, we are not designed for killing in war. Possibly, we should at least say that in the innate self, our natural self, is sympathetic, and the social self, at the very least, isn't sadistic, right? If we think of people doing psychopathic behavior, they absolutely deteriorate psychologically. We are not made for war and killing. Now, let me get a little nerdy in talking about the psychology here. Your midbrain, right, your limbic system, hippocampus, amygdala, if you're a psych major, I hope you like those words, this controls the brain's resources, how it allocates resources to different things. For instance, why do people faint at weddings? Well, they are so nervous that their, uh, their midbrain shuts down resources so much that they just collapse, right, out of this complete nerves. Anyway, so in this midbrain is also the control of all resources when you're in a prolonged vigilant or prolonged vigilance or fight or flight scenario. What are we doing? Flooding the brain with adrenaline, right? Getting all our muscles ready to act, paying attention with incredible acuity to all of our perceptions, right? That's what your brain's doing. All right. Now, Let's talk about what happens when there is prolonged vigilance. What happens in the brain? So, your prefrontal cortex is where, sorry, let me do it again, right? Is where your thinking happens. This is where your conscious thoughts are, are going on. And this is also where you're keeping memories. When we think of who we are, who we are is usually a combination of all the memories we've experienced. Well, when you're in a severe vigilance mode, Narrative memory shuts down because you don't need it. And so all of your resources in your brain are going to perception, right? Muscles, right? And energy. And narrative memories are mostly shut down or working at a very superficial level. So now we can put this all together and talk about what the symptoms of PTSD are like and tell the full story. I think this will be very helpful, especially if you are dealing with PTSD or have relatives with PTSD. So, symptoms. One key thing in the background is that neuropsychology, that narrative memory is malfunctioning or shutting down when you're in these moments. So, what is the result of all of these experiences together is, first, a distrust of perceptions. When PTSD is at a very high level, such as what we call combat PTSD, you don't trust what you see anymore. And this becomes absolutely harrowing, for example, for veterans. Now think of this. You are walking to class at CNM. Sorry, I wish we could be at CNM, but we can't right now. You are walking to your class at CNM. Well, if you have these levels of PTSD, what is happening? Your brain doesn't trust its perceptions. Now, you know in your prefrontal cortex that this is safe, this is CNM, this is in Iraq, this is in Vietnam. But notice, you're still used to distrusting your perceptions, and so your brain is thinking, uh-oh, there might be a bomb, there might be a sniper. 
I know. And you feel like you're a crazy person if you have this level of PTSD, but that is what your brain is, is telling you because you have been sort of conditioned to be in that vigilant sort of mode. This is what leads to one of the symptoms that you are all, I think, familiar with, the ideas of flashbacks. But let me show you how absolutely harrowing they are. A flashback at high-level PTSD symptoms doesn't have a narrative memory attached to it. So, for instance, I had a student, and, and notice this is rare, if you have veterans with PTSD, they don't talk about their experiences. And, and let me remember to mention that later. But I had a student that was doing what very well in his treatments for PTSD, and he would tell people about his experiences, right? So let me explain what his flashbacks were. His key triggering event is that he was working as a medic in Iraq, and his Humvee was in a caravan of Humvees going through a city. The first MV in the caravan hit an IED, uh, oh, sorry, IED, yeah, improvised explosive device, and was on fire. Now, what the normal protocol is, is the other trucks turn around and get out of there because that means there, there are these devices in the area. Well, here's where my buddy's narrative was. What he remembers is simply going away from people who needed his help. So his loop, his nightmare he had every night, right, was just me not helping my buddies as they're burning to death is me going away instead of helping. Now notice, because narrative memories are shut down during these sorts of events, the flashback is simply a loop of that experience without a narrative that tells you, oh, that wasn't my fault, our caravan had to leave because that's the protocol to protect everyone. More of us likely would have died. No, you are trapped in simply that loop without a narrative that says, I'm a terrible person, I'm not helping my buddy. Think of how absolutely harrowing some of these others are. There are plenty of veterans that have loops of very limited perceptions. There are famous cases, sorry, infamous cases, where someone's flashback loop is simply the smell of their buddy burning to death. That's all they experience. No before, during, and after, just that smell on a loop. They know the event because they're reliving it. But the narrative isn't filled in because narrative memory was shut down at the time. And so what are they trapped in? My buddy is burning to death and it's my fault. So you are trapped in the guilt experience, right? And that is who you are. So let's think about these sort of experiences, right? Let's think what it's like to live this way. Can I make it to my class or my job on time? No. Can I go the same way every day and show up at exactly 9 o'clock in the morning? No. Why? Because then I will develop a pattern, then the snipers will know where I will be, then they'll know where to put the explosives. Now, of course, if you're thinking this way, you're thinking, I'm crazy, this is completely safe, I am just at my job, I'm just at my school. Well, that's the problem. You don't want to tell anybody what you're experiencing because you know this is crazy. This isn't real, but I still have to act as if it's real because my midbrain won't stop. And I'm also trapped in the guilt of those experiences. So, can you go to a restaurant? Now, here's where some of you should be realizing, oh yeah, my veteran family members don't go to restaurants. Because what, right? If you're in a restaurant, what is happening? A lot of events are happening. People could attack me from any level. There could be a sniper that could enter through that doorway because this is your training during that kind of vigilant experiences you've had. Lastly, let's talk about the possibilities of treatment. Shay does end his book on some sad notes that sometimes treatment can only go so far. Some of these things are just terrible tragedies. But let's talk about the treatments that do have an impact. Although first, I have to do something that Shay did, and this is brilliant. What is the best treatment for PTSD? The very best treatment for PTSD is to prevent it, right? Not have wars, or reduce wars to purely defensive actions. We will talk in the last lectures of the semester about how often these wars are unnecessary, right, if you actually study them. But here's what Shay does. Genius. He says, 
Most people, when I say that to them, I say, we need to limit war and try to get rid of it altogether because human beings are just being destroyed by this, both literally and psychologically. The survivors are suffering still. And what do people say? Oh, war is normal. That's just how human beings are. We've always had wars and we always will. Shea says, that's garbage. Because, think of slavery. If you had a conversation a few hundred years ago and said, we need to get rid of slavery, we should get rid of it, you would hear the same stupid justifications you hear about, getting, about the impossibility of getting rid of war. What would people have said? Oh, that's just human nature. History has always had slavery. We always will. Just get over it. Well, what did we find? No. People got their acts together and eradicated slavery for the most part. Most societies look back at their slavery and are ashamed and would never go there again. So what are the treatments now that if PTSD has to be there because it is there for now, right? And it's very common. Uh, sad little trivia. What percentage of homeless people in a city like Albuquerque are homeless almost primarily because of PTSD? 20 or 30 percent at the least. It's probably more like 50 percent. Okay. All right. So what does work? Now, go back and put this all together. The best treatment that Shea has found is what he calls reconstructing a social narrative. Understand. The veteran with PTSD is trapped in these events of guilt and is trapped by this need to try to overcome this guilt and overcome the vigilance they, they feel constantly. Well, part of this is their self, their idea of who they are, their social identity, is a major casualty. But when they think back of the events that led to this kind of guilt and feeling that they are not worthy of surviving because of what they've done or who they failed to protect, well, they're trapped there and they can't reconstruct the narrative to put it back together. They can't remember that here I am this good person, I joined the military for these reasons, and then my stupid authority figures put me in this battle, and so now I, I went through some terrible experiences that weren't my fault, and now I can become a good person again, I can live on through this. No. You keep having flashbacks that remind you that, nope, you are just that terrible person and there is no continuity with who you are as a good person before and a good person then. You are trapped in those experiences. So what do we need to do? We need to allow veterans to reconstruct a narrative that puts that full narrative together and, as we saw in Sartre's No Exit reading, we need to do this in a social circumstance to gain, other, to gain others' acceptance of that social identity. Here's where we run into the problem. Most veterans have learned, don't tell people about your experiences. They want to reconstruct a narrative so they could be a good person, but they can't find good listeners. Now, please understand, I am not saying you're a bad person or a bad listener. In fact, it's often because you're a good person that you are such a bad listener. Here's what happens. A veteran starts to tell you their terrible experiences. Well, what is the normal reaction for a good, sensitive person? First reaction, they break down. If you're a sensitive person, you say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Or even worse, right, is you say, oh, it couldn't have been that bad. Now notice what's happening. Two things are happening to the mind of the veteran. They are saying first, right, you are saying that didn't happen or it wasn't as bad as, it, as, as you think. It couldn't have been that bad. I'm sure you meant well. Well, what are you doing? You're telling them that your perceptions aren't valid. That didn't happen. Distrust your perceptions again. What do you sound like? You sound like the worst officers during wartime. What do officers say? You go to your officer and say, hey, those were some kids in that house. I think we just killed some kids. What does a stupid officer say? Don't get sad, get even, right? Not your fault, didn't happen. Notice, distrust your perceptions. Now, what is another common response, right? The veteran hears you say, there's, you're feeling their trauma. Oh, that's awful. Now, how do they feel? Oh, great. Now I'm just making someone else feel bad. I'm not telling my story anymore. Look. They're crying because of what I've experienced. Now I'm producing more harm. I will learn to shut up. Do you get the idea? So what do you need? 
You need to find a listener that can help you reconstruct your narrative and not be traumatized or deny what they're hearing. So what does this mean? You usually need another veteran. This is what is terrible about modern warfare. Modern warfare does not encourage long-term relationships with, between veterans because, let me go into the background, we have learned psychologically that in war, if too many casualties of your direct buddies happen, that you lose your will to fight. You lose that kind of troop solidarity if, and I don't know what the number is, some, some people would say it's if 30% of your battalion or your small group is killed, that you lose the will to fight. You just have too much guilt, too much shame and remorse. So what did they do in wars like Vietnam? They didn't have people think of themselves as a group. They had people think of themselves as a singular soldier. I hate the fact that one of the slogans for the military a handful of years ago was army of one. That is the stupidest idea. Well, the idea of having you be an individual meant that we would never face this, say, 30% threshold of that many casualties in a unit. We just keep bringing in new guys and having new other guys transfer all the time, so you never have that kind of solidarity where you lose the will to fight. Well, what is the result? If you look at World War veterans, what do they have? Long-term relationships. They traveled there together in country, they returned home together, and they stay in touch throughout their lives, so they know who to talk to when they need a listener. Soldiers these days, if they have a couple of buddies that have their experiences, that's great, but that's usually as big as it gets. They, they don't usually have ongoing, several relationships of people that they can talk to or listen to them to help them reconstruct a sense of who they are. I am not a bad person. That was not my fault. I am the same person I was before the war, and I'll reconstruct a new identity now, and you people will listen to me and accept my new sense of who I am so I can move on.